Geology, Geology, Geology. Welcome to Mini Geology Program, uh, KPFT, beautiful Montrose headquarters in Texas, USA. Welcome to everybody around the world. Today, early this morning, we have Bob Frickland. He's a chief upstream strategist from IHS Market Energy. IHS Market uh, provides information and analysis to support the decision-making process of businesses and governments in industries. Uh, these industries could be like financial markets, uh, aerospace, defense and security, even chemical, but above all, energy. So energy in here, as you know, in Houston and Texas is a big capital world. So we are in Houston in the uh, capital uh, uh, of energy and we're going to see the relationships between uh, geology, energy and the markets. So Bob Franklin with us early today. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Daniel. All right. So I see that uh, in your business card is written Global Upstream Strategist. What does it exactly mean? You know, that, that's a great question. So um, my, it, a couple of years ago, my nieces and nephews at Thanksgiving, like all of us, were you know, asking, well, what does Uncle Bob do? And they said, well, he travels a lot. He's always somewhere interesting. He always has an interesting story to tell about some country that he's been to and some uh, particular problem he's working on. But we don't really know what he does. We think he works in the CIA. <laughs> but in actuality, what the, a global upstream chief does is works with companies, um, financials, around the world in helping them solve their uh, major problems related to uh, geoscience and related to the commercial application of that for uh, finding oil and gas. So and when you say global, you really mean the entire planet? The, the, well, I've not been to Antarctica. There's nobody down there to help, but uh, it's pretty much the world. Um, I'm, you know, kind of average at least uh, 30 countries a year that I'm in uh, to go work with different people on. And when you say upstream, what do you mean by upstream? Yeah, that's a great question because it, it varies from company to company what you mean by upstream. To us, uh, upstream really revolves around oil and gas and how that fits in the energy paradigm. So you're not talking about uh, biofuels or coal or renewables? Correct. We take those into consideration, obviously, because when you look at the new com competition, um, one would be um, taken aback or a bit naive if you didn't consider then the, the other fuels, right? So if you're in a basin for example, in Europe right now, um, what do you see when you go on a train from Budapest to Vienna? Windmills. So what's happening with the price of renewables right now is it's getting competitive to the power price from natural gas uh, and from fuel oil. So you have to keep in perspective then as we're looking for oil and gas that that is now only one of the alternatives so the old days when it was gas on gas competition is now still here, but we also have this new competition, which is the renewable pot. So the reason why you follow the oil and gas is because it's the largest piece of the cake. It, it is, and it, it will be. You know, so we're in this energy transition. It's not the first one. You know, in, in modern times, uh, there's never been an energy transition where the past. Um, fuel has not, you know, s continued onward, except perhaps like whale oil. But when we look at, you know, c the era of coal, coal is still around. It's still the dominant fuel for m many places in the world. Um, as we go forward and we transition to this next one, it's obvious, and, and our, all of our statistics show that we're going to be moving towards one that's much more diverse, which is a lot more renewables, a lot more solar, and it varies from country to country. Uh, overall, right? If you've got places like Europe where in some places they've completely um, scheduled to get off of fossil fuels, you have other places that are seeing it as much more diversity of supply, which is 
really what energy security is all about. So from this overarching point of view, uh, when do you see that the transition started? With this, you can understand it through the analysis. And when do you project that transition will terminate? Yeah, and that's a great question, too, in that it's not like it all of a sudden you turned a switch and one day it started. This has been going on um, for at least the last 20 years. It's only started to pick up steam in the last say 15 years um, as the scale starts, right? What did it happen? Why did it start 15 years ago? Well, I think it, a lot of it started out of necessity. There are certain parts of the world that are off the grid, so to speak. So they started looking at alternatives. Um, we've, we've always had a kind of a biofuel end of things. And solar and wind were things that we knew about, right? You even go back to um, the Netherlands, right, when they had windmills. Oh, yeah. We had windmills here in the United States um, in the 1800s where people used those in order for irrigation. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily a new thing. It's just a matter of technology, a uh, matter of, of uh, need. Maybe incentives as well? And some incentives. Now, that's come on later when we started the, the incentives. And, and there's been a kind of a gradual change in that, right? We've gone through the ethanol the phase you know, which first went into fuels, and that was started because of energy security for the U.S. and other countries where there was a worry of uh, us running out of, of gasoline for transportation. And, of course, we've si since blown through that. Now, ethanol is still a part of that, um, and, the, and refiners will still use that as part of their diet, so to speak. But, you know, we're, we're moving to other fuels, too. When is this transition uh, reaching a, a point in which we may say we finally got this transition? Well, the, the pinnacle um, of the transition is still another 10 years out. Um, it depends, though, also, it, as, again, it varies from country to country and region to region. I mean, if you think of Texas, in your opening statement, you said, well, Texas is big in energy. Well, what's the number one energy product in Texas? Have a guess. So number two is wind, right? So here's a, here's a place that most people consider or, or think of as the oil and gas sort of capital of the U.S., particularly now with the Permian. Uh, but it's also, if you went out to West Texas, it was one of the earliest and, and the earliest leader in wind. And that gets lost sometimes. So that's a great um, demonstration of sort of this blend that'll start to move forward. And, and as that'll happen, at the, as the scale gets there, uh, the costs continue to come down, and also the technology, if, as you get more revenue there, that gives you more money to uh, play in the R&D space and to look for other ways to um, lower the cost, just like we do looking for oil and gas. Who is the the country in the world today or the region in the world today that is most advanced into this transition? Who is first in this race? Well, I think, you know, I have to be careful on the definition of that because when you look at many countries, they've always had renewables, right? Latin America, for example, is very, the power business is very much based on renewables and that renewable is water. And that's been there forever. So places like Chile, or even major, you know, much, much larger countries like Brazil, they are based on a hydro system, which is a renewable. But that is a legacy. It's not so, really their own, uh, uh, they don't decide proactively that thing. So now they're, they're adding these additional fuels for the diversity. Um, but when you kind of look at who's leading right now, it, it's, it's really some of the European countries from a pure um, renewables on the solar and in the wind side. But there are a lot of folks that are moving fast in the Middle East, of course, certain states in the U.S. So may we um, say that Germany is one of those? Uh, Germany is one that's very proactive, but, you know, there are hiccups along the road, right, uh, for sure. You, um, we tend to think sometimes in things, back to your point about uh, transitions, are these things very abrupt or not, and they're not. You can't just, and there was a perception that we could just turn off the fossil fuels as a power generating um, a ch choice, and and we would substitute it immediately. 
And it, it just doesn't work that way, and it never has, right? That's why coal is still around, and that's why um, as we go forward, natural gas uh, for sure and oil will be for not only for transportation but also petrochemicals. And, uh, and almost everything that we touch or wear or have has got some kind of a petrochemical um, oil-based product in it, is whether it's fleece or... In, many, in all of these uh, parameters that you study in your analysis, uh, what's the role of the people in the society? Do they have any role in their decision? Is the, the power of uh, deciding which kind of energy you want to use, has it any weight in this um, transition? Yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the, we've seen this. Um, it's more of an, a newer phenomena. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years overall where the social um, footprint is is weighing a lot more in the decision making so society is weighing in 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 a, in a very much more vocal way do you see um, exactly where are these uh, doors through where the society enters into the decision making space well, it's what's really happening now is is a kind of a combination of this consensus, as as well as the market, right? And you have to be very careful that um, you don't be a heavy hand with politics and with consensus on things, because unless you want to pay the difference, right? Um, it's it's a cost thing. So somewhere somebody's got to pay if you don't choose the uh, cheapest alternative. And whether it's you or I that pay for that or something else. So it's, it's just like your utility bill. Um, in, in Colorado, you can opt as well here in Texas to have a certain percentage of your uh, power uh, come from renewable resources. And in fact, in Colorado, you, there's a utility up there, Holy Cross, that actually it's a co-op and you get a dividend back every year based on, you know, what the differences are. So... There are lots of options, but you got to be very careful um, to decide whether you want how much market you want things to be driven versus how much um, policy uh, that you want to drive things. So, things. Let, let's uh, talk a little bit more about people because here at Mini Geology, we're interested in this the the, the human side of the geoscience and uh, also the markets in, in in this case. So, you are an established media consultant and uh, and source for both print and and television. So, what is the most common question the media ask you? Yeah, to, today one of the most interesting question. Um, particularly in the upstream business, really is, is this, um, what's the future of exploration? What's its role? So if you take a stock price and you, particularly for an integrated company, uh, such as an Exxon or a Shell or you know, one of the majors that have both um, downstream petrochemicals, uh, gas, and or uh, exploration, the, the discussion turns around pretty much any sh share price, which is what drives that share price. And so th there's a big discussion right now around, well, do we really need exploration to continue to add things, or can we get the barrels we need through just mining existing fields or existing areas? So there's a big question around that because exploration is the sexy thing, right? That's sort of what I spent most of my life on the new ventures and, and you do, which is traveling the world, trying to solve problems um, using science. And very few no data. That with very little data that nobody else has. Um, and, and with this jigsaw puzzle, come up then with some new deposits, right? And this is a, a critical skill that's needed and it's very difficult but if we don't find oil through exploration um, then what does that speak for the future you can go a few years without um, restocking the shall we say the uh, the portfolio through exploration but eventually you know because you're producing your existing fields it's going to disappear so granted that the the dominant amount of production that we add is through field growth, as we call it, or from existing fields. 
Um, exploration, though, is still critical in the future. Okay. So that would be your question. That's one of the number one uh, questions from people right now. Uh, an- there are other variations of, of course, North America, which is, you know, ha- um, originally when we started in North America, it was very interesting. There was a lot of of doubt around the unconventionals. There was saying, a, a lot of folks in the rest of the world said, well, this is this is really interesting, but it's not economic. It's going to be gone in kind of a flash in the pan. And then after we got the first million barrels of, of new production, people are saying, well, this is still, you know, it's still relatively limited. Not, and then we get the next million and a half barrels a day of new production, and people start paying attention. It was very interesting to watch some of the uh, foreign governments and, and major producers uh, and, and, and groups like OPEC kind of trying to understand uh, how long will this game go. Well, now... I think everybody sees the magnitude because it is a disruptor, right? It's, it's the biggest revolutionary thing in uh, in the last hundred years or so in the oil and gas business. The question is, well, back to that same original one, though, is how long can it go? Will there be what we call in our shop sweet spot exhaustion? Uh, or because the way that we think about things has changed, um, this will just keep going. And what I mean by that is when in the old days we used to think more or less in a three-dimensional layer, but a single layer model. And we looked at things in a barrels per acre foot, but it would and that's how when you do your economics and everything, everybody looked at things on a how many resources are there in a you know in that particular square mile. But what we've learned through playing with these unconventionals and tight rocks is that we had the science wrong from the beginning. We didn't really understand how much oil was actually generated and where it went. So that threw everything upside down because we, we were taught, many of us, some of the younger folks probably listening have been taught um, likewise these days, but we were taught that shales and certain other source rock carbonates were not reservoirs. And now what we know is that oil exists in source rocks that could be actually found and and produced. We know that it's adjacent to those. We know that it's in the basin centers away from those. We know that it's trapped in stratigraphic traps then, which are sort of similar. We know that it's in structural traps and it's in combinations. So it's in at least six different places. And so, therefore, the game has changed to that of a cube, and it's managing that three-dimensional volume. And our role as geoscientists and engineers and commercial folks is then understanding how to unlock that, what's the technology and price and kind of above-ground issues that will help us unlock that. And the key then is to go and look for places where that cube is the richest in the world. And that's what um, we term super basins. So uh, before going into the concept of super basins, uh, can you explain us why the unconventionals, they really represent a revolution? And uh, where did they start? And what is the role that Texas play on this revolution, if any at all? Yeah, I mean, the unconventionals, it's nothing really new. I mean, it, it's been around for many, many years. Um, many of the early wells have always drilled through um, tight rocks. And, and and you're down, when we mean tight rocks, these are rocks that are, you know, in the nano darcies of kind of permeability. Um, and that everybody said, you know, it's, it's worse than concrete, if you want to think of it, that there's nothing that will ever flow out of this, right? Because the game of oil and gas is about um, economics, and it's about getting an economic flow rate. Exactly, and in that point is where I want to go. How did the unconventionals change the markets? Not just technically understanding that uh, through the techniques of um, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, we have a new source in a new rock, which is the bat rock, uh, rich in organic matter. But how did this technical revolution affect the market? What did it happen in the war? How did the markets react? Yeah, well, well, it's a super supply change when you kind of think of something that goes from zero 
to five to six million barrels a day kind of range in three to five years is just phenomenal. We've, you've, we haven't seen that kind of a supply shock um, other than in the early days in the Middle East, a little bit in Alaska. You know, there's that's just a massive amount. In today's world, we have some supplies that are similar in size, like Brazil, massive amount. But it's offshore, and the time from from discovery to first oil is seven to nine years. Whereas this supply is very different because it can come online and it's well by well generated and it's onshore by and large. It can come online in six months. Was they- and then if you, you know, incrementally, because all you need to do is then drill more and more wells to build it up, it's, it, the key thing then is this is the most flexible capital um, inf- kind of investment that's out there in the uh, upstream business right now, outside of you know getting next to existing fields, so that's what's m- made it the darling of Wall Street. That's what's made it the darling then of the companies, because you have this short-term, flexible supply that so you can you can react very quickly to volatility and price. So when the oil price or the gas price goes up and down, you can pick up more rigs or you can drop rigs. And it's it's unprecedented then in the business uh, in our ways, right? The um, overflow of product uh, generated by the unconventionals uh, created the, the drop in price in the oil? No, I, I mean, when you look at oil price vol- volatility, there's always a number of factors. Um, a, a large part of that is ge- demand driven, and you know when we we saw the, the the economic drop in the world, that was a key problem uh, in going forward. Oversupply for sure. Um, you know when the market gets imbalanced is, is definitely the other part of it. So two things happened at once. You know you had the world with the economy that was dropping. And you had the United States, you had the Middle East, you had Brazil, you had at least four other major areas um, continuing to produce new new production. And we ended up sort of what I like to tell the story is we're kind of like a middle-aged man. So when you go to the doctor um, these days for your annual physical, he looks at you and he looks at says, well, you know, your eyes are fine, you still see pretty well. Test your ears, they're still pretty good. He listens to your heart or maybe puts you on the stress test. Looks pretty good. Looks at you kind of and says, well, the only problem that I see is you need to lose 10 or 15 pounds. You've got some spare capacity in the middle there, dude. And what do we do, right? Well, just this time of year is the, is the perfect time of year when we all go on a New Year's resolution we're going to try to lose that weight, right? We want to fit in those pants or those shirts that we used to. And we start making progress. We lose maybe three or four pounds in the month. And what happens? Well, it's time to go to the graduation or it's time to go to a wedding. And we blow that out. So that four or five pounds that we lost all of a sudden becomes only two. And when you look then at that poor middle-aged guy, he still has spare capacity, right? And in some ways, that's what we've been dealing with um, with the oil markets, right? Because we have all this inventory, and that's why you saw the fundamentals shift from supply and demand watching to looking at the inventory. That's one of the keys to, to looking at price going forward. Same thing. As we we dialed back production at OPEC and in Russia... United States continues to push more oil out. Brazil continues to push more. So this spare capacity, we work some off, but we also gain some back. So it's it's just like the guy that's trying to lose that weight. It takes a while. It takes yeah. some um, consternation in order to make this happen. We're uh, getting closer. I like that analogy. We're getting fitter. but <laughs> So in, in, what about in this analogy? Where... Uh, help us again with the analogy where 
what would which would be the analogy of the capital efficiency in the cost reduction so this is the other amazing thing that happened um, you know the, the original thought was by everybody that well when the oil price drops North America is going to shut down it just can't go because the the average project when we look at the statistics and uh, on a well by well basis and build it up and look at the economics needed between 60 and 70 dollars a barrel in order to break even the average now there's stuff a lot better and so when the prices drop down into the 30s and the, and the low 40s logic would tell you those guys have got to stop doing anything and a lot of them did but what happened was two things one is there was a massive layoff then of of, of activity and that's why the rig rate you know the rig counts dropped and the rig rates then followed because they need work, right? And so all of the oil field service, which is generally, this happens every time there's a cycle, that structural cost dropped dramatically because of the, you know, more rigs, more frac crews, more things chasing fewer jobs. So that competition drops stuff. The same time, though, companies, as the number one thing when you're drilling wells, whether it's on conventionals or anything else repetitive is you got to get better at two things one is getting your production rate up and the other is getting your cost down well people discounted how good the North American operators were at that and overall we were able to drop then those break-even prices down between 30 and 40 dollars a barrel so this was unprecedented unprecedented and the big question everybody has is, well, okay, that structural cost change, which is the oil field services, that always is through through its life cycles. Um, when we look at our work, shows that it's followed oil price. So, if you look at that that thirty dollars a barrel of drop in price, how much of that will will come back? How much will we, we be able to maintain? Um, versus from de from the efficiencies that we did. And so that's the big debate that's going on. We're already seeing in places like the Permian where in a couple of other basins where there's um, more activity than there are crews, we're seeing some inflation. So some of that structural cost, 10 to 15% kind of number is coming back. But at the same time, though, these clever operators are continuing to drive those efficiencies and those productivity rates up so it's it's a real interesting game that it's unprecedented so sorry about the long answer but this is a, um, a unique phenomena then about the US now when we look at the offshore it's different the offshore has taken longer to get to bottom so to speak on cost and a lot of that's because of two things one is it's a longer-term business um, best-in-class first oil to production in the deep water has more or less been three years. We just saw one, for example, E&I um, at Zor, their big discovery in the Mediterranean, Egypt, did that kind of number. In the Gulf of Mexico, we've got at least two of those. We've got one in Malaysia. So that's the benchmark to hit. But that's very rare. The average is seven, and in some basins, it's nine years. So that's a lot of time to put billions so parked out there. You're, so you're telling us there is no more uh, time for uh, these mega projects. This is not the right time to pursue these mega projects. Let, let me finish this, and I'll come back to the mega projects for a second. So the the other part of the cost then for the offshore that why it hasn't come down as much is that because those are long lead items and longer lead projects the rigs are on long-term contracts by and large and those are now almost we're getting to the point where almost all of them will have rolled over now so we've seen rigs in the world go from six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a day to a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a day now and those are almost imagine that so that savings for the deep water is is getting there and it's not quite a equivalent to what you see on shore from a you know an average break even but it's it's making it much more competitive so 
So this this will be the last year of the bottom, and then we'll we will start up for that. Now the mega projects, which you generally associate with LNG, deep water, a few areas in the Middle East, and a few major um, onshore discoveries, and and some might argue that you know some of these massive onshore fields are really mega projects, but they're run by 30 or 20 companies or even 10, right? If you think of the Eagleford, the Carnes Trough is the sweet spot, right? And there's a group of operators that's much smaller there. But the the mega projects, the interesting thing is that we tend to um, be in the wrong part of the cycle for approvals when you look at... So if you look at the LNG projects that are just coming online now, after seven to nine years, they were all FID. So they their final investment decisions were made when oil prices were between 70 and $100. And they came out, many of them, in the 30 to $40 range. So there's a, there's a big problem of when we FID. Now, when the oil prices are the lowest, is when you should be actually approving those. But it's also, it's a, it's a complicated time because when you look at the cash management and the cash flow of companies, um, you know, when the oil well, commodities are down, there are very few that can actually manage to, to handle that, that financially, right? Because they're conserving cash. They're, they're, you know, we always, when we go through these down cycles, we shut down exploration. We focus on de- development. We focus on exploitation. We focus on studies. We don't do uh, a lot of kind of new things. And so it's a little bit contrarian. The other thing, though, that um, that's interesting when you look at the mega projects and, 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 and our studies have shown that the in the past years, in those years when the commodity cycle was hot, there was so much competition that 75% of the projects were delivered over budget and not on time. And so that was another major problem. So what the future is, and there's a lot of the big companies are now starting to ask those questions, is there a different way to do things? And how do we then deal with these large-scale projects? So how did E&I go from, you know, zero to, th- to production in three years in a major new field? Well, it's by modularizing things, by um, approaching things that they're not all new projects. So asking yourself, um, is there something that's suitable that's already out there from a a model and a technology. Um, In some places where there are FPSOs, it's it's, um, design one and build many. Uh, Many cases, it's just some changes on the top sides to make it work. So there's a whole new attitude around development of these, um, so quote unquote, mega projects. You've seen it in the Gulf, right, where Mad Dog, they dropped things 30 to 40 percent uh, on the cost. You've seen um, companies like Shell do the similar things at App- Appomattox. And, you know, there's a, there's a long list now of companies that are looking at things totally different. They're looking very hard at the analogs. We spent a lot of time working with people to look at the analogs, the best-in-class examples on how they did it. How did those guys that got to um, zero to, to first oil in three years do it in what did they do different? It, it all goes back to kind of one of my philosophies is that every day you should sort of think about um, how many times somebody told you that's the way we've always done it and, and ask them why. And, and that's whether that's this whole discussion around um, the unconventionals or whether it's about the engineering projects, that's something that I kind of try to ingrain um, in folks that I work with as, as well as the young folks, that that's the, that's the way to approach stuff. Uh, sometimes there's a great reason why we've always done it that way and it and stands up, but other times there may be a better way to do that or a different way to do it. And when you're looking for oil, that's the key, right? Because it's not, in many cases, the, the critical point is, being, is the creative innovation comes from the people that are synthesizers. 
that have a very broad background who maybe talk to you today, Daniel, and you give me some idea. I go down the street or later in the week and I talk to another colleague or another friend and some little thing gets stuck in my mind of, and I put these pieces together as a puzzle, that's where the great innovations come from. That's, and, and some of that then comes about by asking that question of, you know, why? And I think that you set very well the stage now uh, with the key words of uh, low exploration, high exploitation, uh, new ideas, um, continuously asking uh, yourself how to improve. For the topic that we left aside for a moment about the super basins, uh, do you want to tell us uh, something about the super basic uh, concept that you came up with uh, a few years ago? Yeah, I mean... It it's, it's a very simple concept um, to kind of look at basins differently because we're used to, when we look, look at basins over the last years, and I've been in the business 38 years, we always kind of had a, a simple model of how things worked, right? We tended to focus our, our exploration on plays. We tended to focus on individual layers. We, we tended to kind of... Um, look at things very scientifically it was a it was a very um, kind of regimented way that we got into and when we started I started looking around the world um, at basins I started thinking about this tight rock revolution of which the unconventional so to speak started and said well this richness concept of how much um, resources are there on a square mile basis, but really in this case in a cubic region, um, what is, is there anything that when you look at these basins, whether it's the New Can Basin, whether it's East Siberia, whether it's Permian, and it's so on around the world, is there some kind of characteristic that works for all these? And we, we, we are lucky, you know, we have the world's largest databases and so we can play with these kind of games. And so, so a group of my colleagues and I got together and we said, well, let's look at this even more detail. And we went through about 430 basins and we high graded those based on the amount of proven production, the amount of remaining production, the number of stacked pays, that's the way we could get at that volumetric question, we looked at the infrastructure. What kind of infrastructure was there? And we looked at the above ground. You know, how easy is it to to operate? What's the government framework of it? And we said, all right, let's let's put this kind of in the hopper and the machine, you know, the computer and and spit it out, right, and see what we find. And we came out then with, you know, a, a broad spectrum, not surprising out of 400, but there was a group really of the top 50 of which we have the, the best of the best, which is tier one we call it, and of those 25 basins in the world that have the remaining potential because of these vast types of resources, not, not just um, unconventional, but conventional field growth, etc., have the potential for about 850 billion barrels of oil. This was only looking at the onshore. We're looking at the offshore right now. And this to us was just phenomenal, right? And then there's another tier um, just below that, which provides another over 100 billion barrels of, of equivalent. And then we said, okay, well, what about the accessibility to this, right? You know, some of these are in the Middle East. Some of these are national oil companies control completely. Well, there still are sufficient numbers of these for IOCs and other you know, um, non-national oil companies that can, can play in this game. And then you start looking at, well, if you look at the different companies, how many of them are some of these companies in? Well, the super majors tend to be in about 15 of those basins. The smaller ones, et cetera, go, you know, goes down with commensurate with size. 
But when you kind of think then about the role of an oil and gas company, which is you know, providing a, a shareholder return that's um, you know, comparable with other uh, options for investment, being in these basins provides a great place to be. You still have, um, you know, when you look at the exploration business or the upstream business, you have a portfolio and you have portfolio options. One of those options is these proven basins then, and that's where the super basins are the, the, the um, far end of that spectrum. Now, the other end of that um, is what we, I call mini basins, and those are the ones that um, – so the super basin to me then the best is 5 billion barrels of equivalent oil that's already been produced and at least another five remaining – and in most cases, it's a multiple of that. The super basins then, in most cases, have at least 10 of these stacked pays. In many cases, they are disruptors. The Permian is the, is the, you know, the whale of North America with its 100 billion barrels, as we estimate it, potential. The um, Permian also has been its major supply disruptor on a global basis, right? When you think of, the, of Texas is now over 2.5 million barrels a day of production almost, right? It's massive, right? It's, this is OPEC size kind of production. It's more than Mexico produces, right? It's more than almost every other country in this hemisphere. It's, so it, it's a massive impact. So that, that's the super basin, and then from a geological standpoint, it's interesting that many of these tend to be, because of the stack nature, are obviously then in what? They're in foreland basins. Not all, but many. So then when you look at, um, there, and there is a transition of these now as we're working on the offshore, there's a transition then or into the offshore, because the offshore bit model is different, right? These aren't necessarily foreland basins. They're either some kind of transgression or regressional kind of thing, so backward stepping or forward. And so when you look at them, the stacked pays are maybe offset a little more. But there are still ones like the Santos Basin, right, that's that's a super basin. There's no argument. So they can be carbonates as well as clastics. Um, there's transitional ones, which are things like the North Sea, and, and so that's the kind of the super basin. But then when you look then at the exploration discoveries around the world for the last 10 years, and you look at the record of the number of giants and super giants, so those that are 500 million barrels and above, very, very few, right? We can count those on our, on our fingers yep. on an annual basis. Um, in many years, like last year, there was only two, right, sort of thing. So... Um, What's happening then is that the, the, the kind of the other part of the story is when you look then over those 10-year period, we opened 19 new plays or basins globally, 19. So when you look at that on a map, that's pretty impressive. I think, boy, the exploration guys are really doing well. But it's the scale that's the, that's the issue. So we're, we're not finding those super giants. So, the, so what I've termed those are mini basins then. And so these mini basins then are ones that are have generally that's less than five billion barrels equivalent overall. And it, this is in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know the richest mini basin in the Gulf is the Mars Earth one, but there are many others that are out there that are still being developed or not. To you know things like um, Flemish Pass or you even go to West Africa, MSBC. We're you know we're watching to see how uh, Guiana. Uh, ends up here with the Exxon discovery, but generally they end up with about three and a half billion barrels of or less of recoverable. What is the main it's, reason? It's a geological problem. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And what is the main reason why we don't find more uh, super basins? Because they simply don't exist? I, th I think we have to ask that question uh, and go back to thinking about um, the characteristics of the largest discoveries in the world when you look at the, the past um, history for more than 50 years, what you see at those spikes, those peaks, are not clastic reservoirs, they're carbonates. Yet, very few companies, and I can count those on my 
on my one hand here um, actually have a focused carbonate exploration program. So part of it is that. So maybe it's your question is maybe we're looking in the we haven't and why is that? we're not is looking the, at the right is place. That a cultural legacy that we have looking more into plastic basins rather than carbonate ones. Abs well, they're easier, right? Carbonates are very tricky, very tricky. And most of the unconventional are carbonate systems. There, they are for sure, and. So th there's a little of that. When we look at those um, offshore basins, part of it is um, those plastic systems. Where we've been, we haven't been out in many cases down to the basin floor fan because they're way out there. But in many cases, these are slope shelf fan systems, and they're not come off of major river systems. So they're not coming from the the Nile. They're not coming from the Mississippi. They're not coming out of the Amazon. They're coming from smaller shelf slope systems, uh, and so their um, their volumetrics are different. Right, so that's part of it. So it is a little bit of a geological issue from that standpoint. But but I think um, you know there definitely are places to still look for these mega mega plays. Mega plays tend to come about every nine years. When we look at it statistically, uh, which, three which times. was the last one? The last big one, um, arguably, right now is is still um, the Brazilian uh, pre salt. We've we're watching to see what happens in the MSGBC, so Mauritania Senegal corridor. Um, it's getting a little bigger, but it's it's not quite there. The second kind of one that's there uh, is East um, East Africa, the Mozambique Tanzania. Um, one's oil, one's gas, and and that's been the you know that's been the history um, now for the more than than 25 years is that we've been finding more gas than oil. It's um, again, it's a it's a geological, it's a factor of of where we're going, it's a factor of the rocks, and et cetera. I'm interested in uh, understanding the your mindset when you came up with the uh, super basin concept. It's something that it came up little by little, day after day, or there was a moment where you really synthesized a, a mongous uh, amount of material and ideas. Well, yeah, it's, it started off relatively easy, you know, easy with, kind of, as I said, kind of looking at stuff. I kind of started looking at things and started seeing this grouping. And then um, my colleagues, you know, I, I reached out to my colleagues to try to help validate this and build the build a better scientific case. Um, and we'll have a paper coming out here in the APG bulletin uh, that describes this even better. Uh, it should be out March or April that my colleague Pete Stark um, and I put together. Uh, and but you know, it's like many things that you you may have that idea, but you need uh, for sure to to uh, harness other folks to kind of progress it but when and we're lucky in that we've you know we have as I say we have better data and more data than anyone so yeah of course but still there should have been a moment when you say uh, okay this is th this well, wait a second yeah this concept yeah that, let's try the very first moment it, when you are not even sure that you had to validate everything when well in 2012 is when I when we first sort of started the discussion and what I what I tend to do is sort of like any kind of scientific thing, peer review it in some sense. So what I did is um, kind of put together some sketches around this, uh, some maps, some basic maps and things, and and I went really and talked to some of my peers, some of the other exploration um, vice presidents and heads of upstream around the world, and and just got their opinions, right? And a couple of them by by just their reaction, saying, well, you know, this is this is really interesting. This is clever because this solves. Uh, part of our problem of uh, of a of a approach and a strategy for proven basins, uh, an approach that uh, is different in the sense of of how we even look at a basin, and so th that kind of gave me the confidence then to kind of keep moving it along, uh, and then incubating it more within uh, our own uh, shop there, you know, and bringing in my colleagues to to help put some more s um, sideboards on it and to. To challenge things and stuff. Well, so it's, by the way, talking about challenges, what were the the weak points of this concept? Well, I think in the beginning there were some 
folks that um, questioned maybe, you know, in, in these basins, well, everybody kind of knows that the Permian or in, in the case of the, the first uh, archetype I had was really New Can Basin. In Argentina. In Argentina. And the question was, was interesting. It, it was around, well, we all know there's a lot of oil there, right? I mean, that was, that's the number one basin in Argentina. We've all known for years that there's stack pays. Um, we've all known for years that there are these unconventional and conventional reservoirs. We've not produced until um, starting in 2009. We had not even tried to do much with the unconventionals. But we knew this stuff was here, but we hadn't really th thought of things that way. So it was sort of like, yeah, you've kind of put a label on something that was already there. But so they were kind of a little bit of that reaction at first of, hmm, kind of interesting, but not there. The The rest of it was then trying to get people to to kind of think then of this multi um, cube kind of dimension uh, as, a, as a problem solver and kind of thinking then of harvesting this this resource in a, in a volumetric way uh, was, was some of the kind of the questions. Some people wondered, well, as uh, I think some of the pushback originally was, you know, I kind of did a lot of it um, in just kind of that way. You know, I, in 38 years, I kind of worked most of the base in the world, so I kind of knew, okay, well, it's Siberia, it's it's um, central platform in in uh, Arabia, et cetera. I, you know, which basin, North Sea, et cetera, which ones they are. And the question was, well, yeah, there's maybe only a handful of those, right? And so it wasn't until we actually went and looked at the data sets and pulled the statistics more and, and put the framework around it that we could, of that 400 or so, we could actually come up with a group that that really did fall together and, and fit those the mini base inside was was a lot easier, to be honest. That one was pretty easy. And was there a moment when you felt like you were lifted up, maybe by somebody or or, or a reaction of, of somebody of or a situation that allowed you to think, okay, this is the moment. This now the concept is going to run better. Uh, it has been improved. There was a quantum leap, and I can bring it. Uh, well, elsewhere. the. Yeah, I mean the the visibility overall started to increase. We we um, so my colleagues put together a paper that we published for our clients. Um, that helped. Uh, then uh, my friend uh, Charles Sternback at the APG, uh, the president, uh, uh, and I had a number of discussions around it. And you know it's now a, a, one of a cornerstone um, things this year and and the future for the APG as they kind of embraced it. And we've. We've got a, uh, a full two-day forum coming up uh, at the end of March, March 27th through 29th, here in Houston, where we're going to go through about 20 uh, of the global basins. We're going to have experts in those basins uh, kind of lay out the case of why they're there. We're going to have, uh, you know, that's the first of its kind, but the, and then we'll also have at Salt Lake. We'll have some more papers on it. So that's helped um, with the community. Uh, in that sense, uh, move that way, and then, and then talking to my peers and things too. You know, a number of my friends have said, you know, we, we're all aboard, right? Um, we understand it, we get it, and we we support this concept. Where, where, where do you want to bring this concept? What is next? Now you have uh, uh, internally uh, the discussion, then you bring it to the client, now you're publishing, you're going to have a conference, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to disseminate themselves, kind of in a cascading effect. What is next? Yeah, so one, one of course, will be the um, the, the conference. The, the next thing, I think, is for us to finish up the offshore. So the upstream team at, at, at IHS is working hard now on, you know, kind of how do we deal with these offshore ones, which are kind of a hybrid. They're a little more different. You know, they're, the stacked pays aren't necessarily right on top of each other, right, because of the prograding nature or, or backstepping. Um, so we're, we're playing a little with that, and how do we – can we slot those into a category, or are they all a different beast too? Um, so that's another concept there. We're kind of continuing to uh, look for ways to improve the resource numbers because what we did was um, what I kind of call the uh, 
a desktop study, right, where we didn't take the basins apart. We're starting to do that some more. We've done that for the Permian. We're working on a couple of other. We're do, we've done it for the North Sea where we've actually taken the, uh, the geology apart more by looking at logs, looking at correlations, you know, and across the basin and trying to improve the uh, the accuracy. And, uh, and, and I think, you know, that's what a lot of the companies are doing. So you're going to stick together with this concept for a little bit uh, longer? The yeah, I think it's... Super basins. Absolutely. The, the supers and minis... Uh, are, are here to stay for sure. So you can come back and talk uh, after the super basins about the mini basin at the mini geology show. <laughs> uh, another time we have been so glad to be with you. Uh, Bob Franklin came from uh, the IHS Market Energy, his chief upstream, uh, upstream strategist. We have been talking with him about his um, super basin concept uh, and uh, he told us how he came up uh, with this concept, he tried to expose himself and his mindset to show us how to come up with uh, new ideas. Uh, I'm glad that he went also through the basics uh, of the economics and how the markets, they, um, they work, especially linking together the uh, geology and our dear earth sciences uh, to the energy and from the energy to the um, uh, to the market. So you are all interested to this thing. So we're talking about things uh, that are important, not just for geoscientists, but for the great society in general. So I'm very glad to have moved from uh, geology to the market, which is a big leap for me. And uh, you're all welcome uh, to come back to mini geology. Uh, come here, knock at the door, 419 Lovett Boulevard, 77006 in Houston, 006. And uh, you can write at minigeology at gmail.com. You can listen to this interview again in the archives of uh, minigeology.com, which is a YouTube channel. Or you can follow the web page. You just Google mini geology and Rice University this partnership that uh, we have to bring geology to the society and thank you so much again for KPFT uh, HD channel that is hosting us and actually we are part of KPFT uh, run by 250 volunteers with only four uh, uh, people on staff and we're going uh, live uh, around the world and even uh, beyond the world because the International Space Station is listening to us as well if they, if they want. Thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Bye.